Hi, I'm Don Moen. I'm glad you've joined us today. We're here at Ocean Away Studios in Nashville, Tennessee uh, to discuss some practical tips on leading worship. Uh, if you're a pastor, if you're a member of a worship band, if you're a singer, if you're a sound engineer in your church, uh, this is gonna be relevant to you. And now the situation that we're in here, we're just setting up to start our sound check. It, it's a studio, so it's not exactly what you're dealing with every Sunday at your church, but the same principles uh, will apply no matter where you are. Talking about tuning your guitar, talking about how the band plays together, talking about the importance of being a sound engineer and listening to the sounds. Uh, if you don't have all these elements covered, you can work really, really hard with your worship team, and, and then it's, it's not gonna translate the way it should. So my prayer is that this will not just be uh, theological foundations or real heady knowledge about worship, and that, those are important things, but I want it to be practical, something that you can walk away with today and, and, and use next week in your church. So I'm glad you joined us. It's gonna be a great time together. Thanks for being here. Okay, we've kind of got uh, everything covered on our, our sound check, and to just give Chuck a chance to dial everything in, uh, we're going to give him a full song, and while we're doing that, that gives us a chance to worship uh, through our rehearsal and our sound check. Amen? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Let's sing thank you, Lord.
we thank you today for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you for your love, for loving us when we were quite unlovable people. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you. reason we spent so much time getting our sound check today is because, um, in, in my estimation, it's probably the most important thing uh, that we do. Uh, you can rehearse all week. Uh, you can um, have the greatest musicians in the world. But if you have a sound engineer who's not listening or is not with the program, he can and he will uh, sabotage uh, everything you've worked for. And uh, sadly, uh, I've, I've experienced that many times. And, uh, and uh, the reality of touring, it's expensive. And if I can only bring one person on the road, I usually bring our, our sound engineer, Chuck, because uh, he, he, my life is in his hands when I'm singing. <laughs> and and um, uh, I've, I've had a lot of experience with sound engineers who who just seem to love to uh, mess with my voice when I'm, uh, when I'm singing. <clears throat> they do weird things with the EQ. They do weird things with uh, uh, reverb. And, and on the stage, it's very distracting because I, I hear it in my ears. I hear it in the house. And it's like, why, why is this guy doing this to me? Um, but it happens. And uh, that's the reason I love to have uh, Chuck Harris with me on the road. Uh, and so... You saw us spend a lot of time tweaking all the instruments, getting the sound checked right. Um, and, you know, Chuck, why don't you just talk a little bit about uh, the importance of sound, uh, why you did what you, what you did. Uh, you know, if you have a sound engineer who was the radio operator on a B-52 uh, 40 years ago or somebody who knows how to solder some wires together, you need to be praying for a sound engineer who has ears because uh, that is the key. In fact, I've uh, told Chuck uh, many years, and one day he'll write this book, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, uh, and pastors, this is for you as well, by the way. You can have a great church. Um, you can prepare for your sermon all week, and, and, and you know this has happened. When you get up there to preach, uh, there's feedback, there's a bunch of stuff happening, and your your sermons are in the hands of your sound engineer as well. So, so you, you just need to be praying that God will send you the right guy or gal. And usually, I'll pick someone who who loves to listen to music and has ears. They they listen, um, 
to what uh, to to what the people are listening to, and and uh, that's what really what you need. So, Chuck, talk to us a little bit about the importance of of sound. Now, t- to preface that, we are in a studio today. Usually, we're in a in an auditorium, a live setting, so things are uh, going all over the place. The sound is. And, and Chuck has a much harder job. This is a, uh, a dream for you because it's a much more of a controlled environment. We're in a studio, a beautiful studio here, uh, Ocean Way in Nashville. Actually, it was an old church. It is an old church. Um, but the acoustics, if you look at the ceiling, uh, they've been treated. Uh, this room could be super echoey and bouncing all over the place, but... Um, and they've got acoustic tiles all over the place, which on the walls and on the ceiling, which helps uh, diffuse the sound. So, uh, Chuck, just talk about uh, the the attitude of a sound engineer, um, what you're listening for, uh, how you approach sound check and all this stuff. Chuck Harris. Thank you, Don. Um, yeah, I, th- I think as a sound man, my job is to be a member of the band and the whole concept for me is that they are um, delivering the music. They're the messengers, they're the musicians, they're the ones that are that are putting themselves out there in a performance situation. My job is to interpret what they're doing and to deliver it to the congregation or to the audience uh, in a way that's faithful to what they're doing. So I'm, you know, we're, what we're doing as engineers is we're putting out the microphones placing them in the right places where we're mixing them subtly in the right ways so that the audience has the best connection with what the band is doing with what the musicians the worship leaders are doing on the platform and and the even the sermon you know it's all it's all part of the experience for the audience is what's coming at them out of the out of the PA system so um, so it's not my job to dictate creatively what happens or to uh, you know to be the boss of what's going on but really to serve what's going on in the room and to, to be as really invisible as possible if if everybody goes out of the room remembering the sound usually that's not a good thing you, you know usually you want them to even not be aware that there's a sound man there you want them to feel like they're hearing the band coming right off of the stage hey Chuck yes. why why do um, it seems like sound engineers um, have can easily have an attitude? I've been in a lot of churches that get real protective of their of their console, and they have this attitude like, "Don't tell me anything. I know what I'm doing." And we have both experienced uh, churches like that. Why do you suppose they have that attitude? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not a psychiatrist, but. <laughs> Insecurity. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, what is it? I think a lot of that is insecurity. A lot of these guys, um, you know, you find you find something that you're good at. You find something that you want to do, and or or maybe you're not good at it, but you think you are, or or whatever it is. But um, a lot of times people feel threatened, and it's not just engineers, although it it seems to happen a lot with with um, engineers at churches. And you know, it's and then and what happens is that these guys kind of feel like. Um, this is my thing. I'm the expert here. Don't tell me what to do. And um, guest engineers will come in, and they're kind of aloof and and uh, and standoffish and stuff. And what ends up happening over the long term there is that there becomes this animosity between the the engineer and the people on the platform. And so people kind of get tired of the attitude and, and there becomes this tension there. And I've just found it so much, I mean, these are my brothers and sisters on stage and we just have so much fun together that I don't, I can't even imagine, you know, wanting to have an attitude with these guys. So, I, you know, it's just important to keep that in check. Yeah, I guess the, uh, the sound engineer has got to be a part of your team. He is, he's as important as any player on the stage. And in my estimation, he's more important because he can sabotage everything you've worked for. So I can't stress enough the importance of praying that God will send you that person who has an attitude of a worshiper. Uh, they are in a hot seat out uh, in the in the auditorium because inevitably uh, people are going to come to you and say, turn down the drums, turn down, you know, why is it so loud? They give Chuck all these uh, evil eyes and, uh, you know, stare him down. So 
so when that happens, uh, Chuck, Chuck is, you've been gracious enough to, um, to, to let it, you know, just wash off your back, but people, people attack sound engineers. They just, they, something's too loud. And, and a lot of times, uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute. This, the room is so live, it's, it's impossible to mix properly. Um, let's talk about monitors for a second, Chuck. Um, what we're what we're using today are in-ear monitors. I don't know. You probably have heard of. Uh, there's several versions out there. I'll let I'll let Chuck talk about them and tell you what we use. But um, a lot of churches have just these wedges, uh, monitor wedges on the stage, and the singers have them. The band has them. The the lead singer has them. And what happens is. Uh, everybody wants to hear their voice. The alto wants to hear themselves more. And if the sound engineer is the husband of the alto, then we're all in trouble uh, because you're going to always hear her voice over everything else. But um, uh, when you have these wedges, they're, they're putting sound back into the room. And if the monitors get too loud, what the people in the audience are going to hear is just this bounce off the back wall, and it's going to be really hard to get any kind of clarity uh, in in the sound. So uh, we are using, we've gone to using in-ear uh, monitor systems. Chuck, talk a l- little bit about that and, and tell them why we use them and what we use. Yeah, um, boy, it's so important for the band to be able to hear themselves, and that's why we do that way. We set up monitors, either speakers on stage or headphones, and they, you know, they can be inspired by good sound in their headphones and because the band needs to hear not only themselves, but they need to hear each other. And that's where we get into trouble a lot with a lot of musicians, especially church musicians, they want to hear so much of themselves that they're not listening as well to the other players. So that's a something for the the worship leader to work through with, with the band, the music directors with the band, how to listen to each other and give preference to each other as you're listening. But So what we've found is that we like to use the in-ear monitors, which basically gives everybody uh, earbuds or headphones on stage. And that... Um, that basically just cleans up the sound on the stage. If you can eliminate as much noise going on on stage, the better off you are. So we take away the speakers and it's all right there. So you don't have sound from speakers leaking into microphones, creating feedback, and also bouncing around on the stage and creating um, unintelligibility for the audience. You know, just that. I've been in situations where the uh, where the band wants their monitor so loud, you they just keep turning it up and they say, I need more of me and more of me. And we, we get it so loud. And then I turn off the front of house speakers and you almost can't tell the difference in volume in the room for, in the audience from the audience because the monitors are so loud. And obviously it's not a good clear direct sound. It's just this muddy sound on the stage because the speakers are all pointing the other direction and bouncing off the walls. So we like to use the in-ear monitors just because it cleans everything up. It also tightens up the band because there's no time differences, uh, delays. Everybody's hearing each, hearing everything directly in their ears without bouncing off walls and, and all of that stuff. So it helps them play tighter and get grooves better and that kind of stuff. What are, let's go through a few uh, uh, systems that we've used and talk about the one that we use now. Well, we started with the Furman years ago. Uh, that was an analog system, and it was, sounded great. It was limiting. Uh, then we, we worked with the Aviom system for a while, and that was great. They sort of pioneered the whole Ethernet, um, sound over Ethernet thing, and that um, that worked great for us for a while. And then, you know, it started catching on, and other people are building those systems now. So you've got... Um, you know, hearback systems for for more of a an affordable thing. A lot of churches are using the hearback system. Um, We've used Ro- Roland as yeah, well. Yeah, the Roland it? stuff. Roland, and they've they've kind of integrated a whole, you know, with their Roland digital board. They've got mixers that work with that. Um, that those are great. It's a little expensive. Behringer now is making uh, the whole digital system with their headphones, and those those work really good and they're affordable. Um, we're using the MyMix system. I like it for traveling. It's got a, uh, each box has a small footprint. And basically what that means is each, 
each musician on stage has his own little mixer. There's 16 inputs, and they can mix whatever they need to hear in their ears. And so the, with the My Mix, the footprint is small, meaning that I can pack it up in a case, and it travels well. Um, and it's got great features. It's got EQ on every channel. It's got master EQ. It's got effects built in. It's got a little SD card slot, so you can uh, record full wave files with it, multi-track, um, all of that good and, and, stuff. And it's affordable. Yeah, and it's relatively affordable. It's you know it'd be a little more than the Behringer, but a lot less than the Aviom, and it really is. And it's the sound. I shouldn't say this out loud, but but the sound is really really good. Um, talk talk a little bit about uh, the importance of investing in good gear in in churches. We're singing in a lot of churches, and we're singing in some gorgeous uh, facilities. And they spent a lot of money building the church, and then almost as an afterthought. Uh, they thought, oh, we better put some speakers, and they, they put some little speakers, and they never properly cover the church. It's really sad, uh, but it's, it's hard to invest the money into a proper uh, PA system for your church. But if you're going to spend 2 or $3 million building this beautiful building, you need to invest significantly into a, a sound system that properly supports the building. Talk about the importance of that, Chuck. Yes. Uh, thank you, Don. Like, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the sound is as much a part of the experience as any other part of the service. Your aesthetics, um, your your preparation, all of that, and your sound is just as important. And there's different components to that. But I would say, as a rule of thumb, Don was mentioning, you know, spending, you know, good money on your system. As a rule of thumb, I heard that. Uh, for a whole, full building budget, if you're going to spend four million dollars on your building, you ought to spend ten percent of your budget on the sound. So you know that'd be like four hundred thousand dollars or something like that on a four million dollar building. Yeah, and all 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 the uh, church budget team just gagged on that number. But but the fact is, then nobody's happy uh, when they built this beautiful facility. Then nobody's happy with the sound. Why can't we hear the preacher? And uh, isn't that what this is all about? You need need to hear the Word of God. You need to hear what's happening. So I really want to encourage you to uh, listen to what Chuck is saying. Invest in a proper sound system. And in fact, you have consulted uh, a lot of people around the world. You could probably be doing this full time if you wanted to, but just uh, going in and helping them try to fix the system they have. But ultimately, it, it's about dollars and investing in proper gear, right? Very much so. And again, training, like you said, getting the right sound guys in place. Uh, good news, bad news. The good news is that, you know, with technology and competition and all the different companies, that the, the cost of gear has come down a lot. And you can do things now with these digital boards and stuff. You don't have to buy racks of, of gear like this now. You know, it all comes built into the board. You can record presets. You can do all of that stuff in these digital boards nowadays. And so the costs have come down. A, quite a bit on gear and the technology's gotten better and better so it's it's possible to put in a good solid system without having to spend you know crazy amounts of money but it's but it is important to get the right equipment for the applications you're doing so how does someone contact you uh, if they want you to come to their church are you willing to do that and how do they um, how do they contact you at the bottom of your screen no. <laughs> Uh, just email me at chucksmix at yahoo.com. Chucksmix at yahoo.com. And if you want uh, more information about the in-ear system we use, uh, that's mymixaudio.com. 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 That's what we're using. Uh, great. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Don. Okay, so uh, we've kind of covered the, the whole idea of sound, the importance of our sound engineer. Um, and, and, and how, um, how important it is to get the right gear. And, uh, now, uh, we're going to break down a song a little bit, uh, just with, with all the players and just, uh, talk about how we approach a song, um, the importance of playing, uh, to the song and uh, not overplaying. And, um, uh, since, since we were talking about this acoustic, uh, treated room earlier, um, Again, this is not a real live situation. Uh, if you're in a, a live room, like a church like this, usually it's going to be so 
uh, boomy. Uh, your drums are going to bleed into everything, and your drummer is, uh, if he's not uh, mature, he's going to end up with an attitude uh, like, uh, you know, why do I always have to be the guy that um, plays soft? You know, a lot of churches, uh, when they walk in, especially conservative churches, they walk in and they see a drum set, immediately they have an attitude. So uh, a drummer ha- has to have a little bit of leather skin and have to have a good attitude because people, depending, again, on the church, they're going to look at you with suspicion. Uh, and uh, uh, But a, a room like this typically... Uh, is going to be a, a real hassle for drums, for a sound engineer uh, to try to get the drums to play soft enough. Uh, so, Tim, uh, is uh, you're, you, when we played earlier, you were playing loud with, with sticks, right? That's right, so, yeah. So, um, typically in a room like this, uh, how would you approach... You're going to be listening to Chuck probably. That's uh, right. Play softer, play lighter. What are some options that you have if, if we're going to play softer? Um, I mean, you know, any drummer is always excited to be able to play with sticks at the full volume. Um, the drums just, they just sound the best that way. That's a great way to be able to play. But you rarely have that luxury in a live situation. Um, so, you know, when we're on the road, we might be playing outside where I they do want to have some volume. But we also might be playing inside a church or um, just an echoey kind of room. And you really have to have some options for that. Um, the first would be, um, do you want me to demonstrate? Yeah, right now you're, you're playing with sticks, you know. I come before you. So that's, uh, you know, that's playing full volume and... Um, you know, my first thing... It's loud It's loud for me as well, In my, you know, as a, as a leader. I mean, that snare is just, uh, just, just killing my ear. So as a worship leader on stage, your drummer, if he's playing super loud, um, you just have to have, have to have a great relationship with him. Within ears, it does kind of plug the sound a little bit so I can, you know, mute some of that. But, boy, if a drummer's playing loud just five feet behind you, it's going to affect the way you sing. You won't be able to hear yourself. So you got to you got to talk about all these things. So in this case, I would probably say to Tim, um, "Your snare is killing me. Uh, can you give me another option?" That's right. Yeah, because you do have you have to be sensitive to the room and to the the audience or the congregation, um, but also to your band. And the, a lot of times, the singers are right. Uh, they have the drums right behind them, like Don. And um, it's it's really going to kill them, and they're not going to be able to hear their own vocals and sing in key and all that stuff that matters um, probably a little more than the drums. Um, so uh, the first thing I would do would be to maybe stick with, you know, keep your sticks, but just tone it down. Learn how to play softer, but with still the same energy. So just hitting a little lighter, don't, you know... You kind of have these uh, levels that you can graduate to or, or go down to. Um, and then I would just, uh, if it's still too loud, you know, they have a, all kinds of different stick um, options now. They have rods. Uh, these are rods, so these are a little lighter. And then uh, if it's still too loud, I would go to brushes. Um, and and you can get creative too. You can get uh, percussion sounds happening, and don't be afraid to uh, mute the drums. Um, you know, throw throw shakers or whatever you have um, on your drums, and and just get different sounds. And that's a cool way to. to so what you music. got? You have a, a a rag on top of your snare. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You can throw a towel, or uh, they make all different kinds of mutes for drums. So you can you can do a lot of different things. So let's but. hear that. There's just one thing that I want. Yeah, play that way from now on. Play. So yeah, you have options. You have lots of options, and you can get creative and uh, try different things and, and work with the band, work with your leader. Talk about the attitude. Like, okay, a lot of drummers, 
uh, when you tell them to play softer, or they're going to say they can't play with the same groove when they're playing soft, and, and they're going to take a little bit of a offense if they're not a mature uh, musician uh, to, to having to play with brushes or rods or something like that. Or in this case, he's covering up his snare with a, with a rag, and, and it's got a shaker on top of it. But a, a professional drummer will play for the situation. So uh, as a worship leader, don't buy into the argument your, your drummer's giving you, like, I can't, I can't play the groove when I play that soft. It's just it's not true. That's right, that's um, right. We played a lot of different uh, situations, and, and I actually like when the band is really close together in a small, sit, sit, a small setting because uh, it's, it's just kind of more fun to play. You hear everybody, but everybody's got to play down a little bit um, to the room, and it, it actually works and is lo- a lot of fun. If you have a n- drummer who's new to your worship team and, um, and, and they finally get their call, like, we'd like you to play drums for the worship service on Sunday, they're thinking, oh, my gosh, it's my big break. I've got uh, this chance to play, and the problem is they start overplaying. And it could, you know, so just just pretend you're that guy for a second, Tim, you know. <laughs> I come before you today. There's just one thing that I want to say. You, Lord, Yeah, yes, beautiful. Um, <laughs> so... so Finally you know, got my way. Yeah, we laugh about that, but it happens. It really does happen. And if the, you know, you'll hear me talk about this with all the band. If the song becomes about you, in that case, it really became uh, about Tim because everybody got, oh my gosh, listen to that drummer. Uh, then you're probably uh, ready for a timeout. You got to sit out for a while, six months. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, but again, what are you playing on Thank You, Lord, now? So you, you could play a bunch of stuff, but, you know, what are you playing on, like, on the first verse? I come before you today. There's just one thing that I want to say. Thank you, Lord. Nothing, see? You, Lord. Let's go to the, the pre-chorus. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, you have anything else you want to say about that? Uh, just that, you know, if you start smaller in a song and then you yeah. actually have somewhere to build if you leave air and space it yeah. it frees the music up to mm-hmm. to reach people and and it breathes it just feels good it sounds good and it's not about the drums it's about the overall uh yeah. element that we're producing together yeah dynamics you know you got you got to be able to start here and go somewhere if you start at double forte you got no place to go and it becomes just kind of this boring um thing so all right and since we're talking to Tim about uh, his his approach to playing, uh, the relationships between a drummer and a bass player are really important. This this is the meat and potatoes of your band, uh, so these guys need to be on the same page all the time. So, uh, Jason, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, your uh, approach yeah. to playing, uh, kind of what you're doing in the group, and yeah. um, like like what are you doing on the um, uh, on the verse, I come before you today. The first verse, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all? Nothing at all. Okay, when do you come in? I come in on the pre-chorus. Okay. With a grateful heart, the song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and thank What are you playing there? Just, just, uh, just bass and uh, bass and piano here. Let me yeah. hear what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, 
see how simple that is? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. And uh, Jason could be playing a lot more than that. Uh, so what are you doing, Tim? The two of you are, I'm assuming you're kind of locking in on that yeah. bum. You're listening to, listening to what? I am listening out for his kick patterns. Okay. So what are you doing, Tim? Um, just playing along. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, Jason, just the relationship between you and Tim. And, and Yeah. Um, one of the things I'll do is uh, I'll simply go ask the drummer about what kick patterns he's playing for the verse, chorus, and for the bridge so that I can um, make sure that I'm hitting the root notes, the bass harmony, the same time he's hitting them. Yeah. So, yeah. What about your approach to playing um, fewer notes rather than more notes? Well, uh, <laughs> in this style, uh, um, the pocket is just keeping it simple. Yeah. Talk about the importance of uh, playing as a team as opposed to an individual. Yeah. Um, well, it, you, you kind of have to think about what's the song, what's the message. Um, I'm more focused on the song and um, what I would want to hear if I was listening. And to have a bass player all over the place distracting from the words from the message would be uh it just wouldn't be good yeah. so um i'm focused on just being a solid foundation and um matching that kick playing uh obviously playing all the right bass notes and um and also i'm thinking about dynamics for a bass player dynamics could be a little different because there are times where you you really don't play and um so that you're not playing anything on the first verse at all. Correct. And then do you play on the second verse? I do. So just what are you playing there? So uh, I, uh, how does what has the second verse? How does it go? Uh, for all you've done in my life, my darkness and gave me thank you. Yeah, so it's you see, it's pretty yeah. simple, and uh, what he said is kind of meat and potatoes. This is the foundation of your whole song, and if these guys are too busy and and not locking in together, it's gonna it's it's just like a house. If you build a house on a shaky foundation, the house is not going to be secure, and eventually it's going to fall down. Right. Um, drums and bass are the foundation for any song, uh, so this applies to um, the the players, but it also applies to Chuck in the mixing or, or your sound engineer because when you're mixing the sound i'm sure chuck it will talk more about this when uh, when he talks about his concepts of mixing but bass and drums usually start any mix that you're that you're working on so it's this it is the foundation and it's important that these guys lock in together uh, and and have a relationship uh that that allows them to work together because that's gonna make or break the song all right, we've talked about um, drums and bass uh, since Lenny is uh, right over here to my left. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what the acoustic guitar is doing. How do you approach playing? Um, uh, what are you doing on this song? S something simple, I know. Well, the, the intro, Tom and, and I on electric guitar, uh, Tom over there, we're doing that same intro together pretty much. Then when it comes to the verse, I'm just doing just uh, diamonds. I come before you today. Mm -hmm. There's just one thing that say. I want to say. Mm -hmm. And then um, diamonds as well on the pre-chorus. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise. Mm -hmm. and then I'll just go to a simple up and down strum on the on the chorus. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. That's pretty yeah. much it. It's simple. Yeah. Uh, when you're uh, talking about acoustic guitar, do you, you lead worship at your church or, do, a yes. lot? Do you lead with electric or acoustic? or how do you? Um, I used to lead with, with acoustic a lot, but uh, since our electric players, we, some, of them, some of them transitioned, so I had to um, go to switch to electric. 
But I see one downfall I see in a lot of acoustic players and, and uh, worship leaders in churches. They always play the acoustic guitar really hard. Yeah. You hear them talk, oh, I'm breaking strings every service. You know, if you're breaking strings on an acoustic <laughs> guitar, chances are you're playing really too hard because an acoustic instrument has a threshold. And when you exceed that threshold, even in drums, you and I have talked about this, Tim, all the tonality goes away from the instrument and it starts actually distorting. So if you want a great tone and a great sound, lighten up your touch. Maybe use a, a smaller, a thinner pick. You're, uh, you got your capo on the third fret the third as well. Fret. Why do you have that? Well, because we're in the key, we're of, the key F, of F. So, And if you want that open sound, have open strings, then you go to the five. But when you go to the, to the four, you're having to do a bar chord. It just seems okay. kind of, it can sound kind of choked off. Yeah. And if you put it on the third fret, you've got a little bit different voicing, and all the chords are open. Oh, I just want to thank all, you. Yeah, okay. It's got a different uh, timber to it, I yeah. guess you'd say. How, how is it, because you lead worship with, uh, Lenny leads worship with the piano as well. Mm -hmm. So um, how is it, uh, as a worship leader, is it easier to lead from a piano or easier to lead with an acoustic guitar? I think it's easier to lead the band from piano because the, the piano is such a dominating instrument. Yeah. But it's actually a little bit easier to, um, to lead, for me, with a guitar as far as um, we're interacting with the congregation. Okay. It's kind of a guitar you can take, you know, take that right hand off or whatever. And, yeah. You know, acoustic guitar is not like the dominant instrument right. where piano yeah. sometimes it can be, you know. Yeah. So, uh, again, it's just uh, you know, what I hear Lenny saying here is uh, simplicity. He's playing uh, just just what needs to be playing, nothing more, um, and it it makes for the whole uh, band to work together. Um, it's not about one individual; it's about playing with with your entire team, and that includes the vocals as well. It's not about one alto or one soprano or one tenor or, or bass or drummer. You'll hear all these guys say the same thing. It's about playing as a team. So. Um, Let's talk to, um, uh, we got Tom Lane on guitar over here. Let's uh, uh, see what his approach is. Uh, give him a chance to talk about how he play, how he approaches playing and, and what he's playing. Um, first of all, um, Tom, I one thing we haven't spoken about is uh, tuning your guitar. Talk, talk about the importance of tuning your guitar. Besides the fact that it's a must. Well, it's an ongoing thing for one, you know, uh, guitars are made of wood, things that change with the atmosphere, things that change with the climate you're in. So I'm constantly tuning, especially in outdoor events, you're always tuning. I'm always tuning because of capos, because anytime you place a capo on the guitar, it's, it's it intonates differently. So you're adjusting it constantly. So it's just an important thing. Anytime we're not doing anything on stage you're or tuning. if there's a moment, I've got it. You know, I've got it muted, but I turn my tuner is always on, so I'm checking my tuning. So where's your tuner? You got it on your on it's your. It's right here on my board. It stays on. I don't have it in a. I've got. I have it in a loop so that it's it's in a constant on mode. I'm not actually going through the tuner and then muting it to to play, which you can set up a tuner that way as well. But I have it set up so that it's always on. My volume's down, and you can see the light lights up, and I can adjust the strings accordingly. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it seems like a silly little thing, uh, tuning, but gosh, you know, it's, if you've uh, worked with an out-of-tune guitar, it's really aggravating, and uh, uh, these guys all have tuners. You know, our bass player, uh, and Lenny's got a tuner. Uh, the only guy that doesn't have a tuner on the stage is me, because uh, I got my piano, but uh, everybody's tuning all the time. Uh, we'll talk about your board a little bit, then, okay. since we're talking about tuning. You've got a, a bunch of pedals there. Yeah. Um, are you using all of them for me? All of them for you, Don. Only, <laughs> only the best. More is more yeah, for right. you. Well, uh, you know, there is a, I call it a meat and potatoes kind of board. I actually have two different types of uh, delay units. One is a multi-effect unit that has more than just delay. Uh, it has a lot of different filtering effects. It has reverb. Now, on this song particularly, I've got two different delays going in two separate units so that I can have a quarter note delay and an eighth note delay, so they're playing off of each other. But aside from that, there's really not a lot else going on 
in the signal right now. You, you see all of this front half of my board is, is what I would call a front end of an amplifier. It's distortion pedals and overdrive and compression. And so as needed, I put them on, but right now I don't have anything on but the delay. And what does that sound like? So what do you so play? I've got a very simple... So are you setting the delay to the tempo of the song? Is How do you set the delay right? Well, you can dial them in on some units or you can tap them in. And in this case, I, both of these have tap tempos. And so I'm tapping all night. I'm tapping, you know, even when even my, I may have it set as a preset, but I'm continuously as we're playing, you know, tapping a delay. And I might actually change within the course of a song from a quarter to an eighth to a sixteenth. And so I'm I'm switching up you know, by tapping it in. So when Tim counts off the song, you usually, you're, you're kind of clicking. Yeah, exactly. As soon as I hear the second kick or click in, I'm, I'm already tapping my foot. Where are you tapping? Right on here. The, right on the pedal. Okay. Yep. And that's the delay. Yeah, exactly. So I can set the... And in this case, here's one delay. And it, here you have a difference in the delay. I can make it short, long... Okay. So you're setting your delays to do different things, and I have two different delays going on so that it accomplishes two different sounds. Yeah. So in this, in you know, obviously playing with Don Moen is not playing with the Blues Council or some of your rock and roll <laughs> bands. So you got to approach it a little bit differently, and in just two delays are giving you the sound of this song. Yeah. So I've got a. See, that would be too busy. So see, I'm typing now. I'm letting the delay work for me. I'm muting the back of my hand, and I'm not using as many downstrokes to play it. So the intro part that Lenny was talking about is typically an acoustic part. I'm kind of following that. So what do you do when we get to the verse now? Um, I come before you today. Combination of swells and diamonds. There's just one thing that I want to say. Thank Using your volume pedal. Thank you. Let's go to the pre-chorus. With a grateful heart. With a song of praise. With an outstretched arm, I will bless your name and thank you, Lord. Just want to thank you, Lord. Yeah. Um, so it gets a little busier as it goes, but it's not a lot. The dynamics again. Yeah. yeah. So what is the name of the board you're using? What do you recommend in terms of gear uh, for the guitar players out there? Well, I, I could say a great staple. If you want a lot of bang for your buck, the uh, Line 6 M9 is one of the better units that you can buy to get everything from delay, distortion, EQ, compression, filtering, modulation effects. How much does that cost? Uh, Three ninety nine, four hundred and something dollars, I think. And you lead worship at your church uh, every week. Well, just about every week. When they let me. Yeah, and uh, you're leading with guitar. Yep, acoustic always. or electric. Uh, both. Uh, most often with acoustic, typically because I, I carry the band, yeah. and it usually is the dominant instrument, and so rhythmically it allows me to to kind of set. set the pace a lot lot yeah. better. So I love playing it with electric, but I lead differently from electric, and it always depends if there's another electric player there. If it's somebody I'm confident in and I can step back, then it's great. I can just I can carry rhythmically what I need to on electric or acoustic. How do you have enough um, discipline to not uh, use all the pedals <laughs> on your board in a Don Moen song? Well, you know, we could. <laughs> We should try that sometime. We'll, we'll do that in a minute. Uh, it, it makes for a big mess. And the truth is, I, the reason I have so many sometimes is we travel a lot, as you know. Um, and everywhere we go, it's different. Every night an amp is different. Uh, and so I literally have five or six different pedals knowing that one of those is going to likely sound okay through a particular amp or another. So I don't need to step on all five or six because they do similar, if not the same things. So I'm just picking the right color as we go. And why do you have two guitars, two electrics today? 
Why do I have two? <laughs> well, um, a lot of it because this particular guitar uh, covers a lot of bases. So does this one. So rather than bringing five or six guitars to give me different sounds, this one that includes some modeling. So I'm able to dial up Gretsch sounds, Rickenbacker sounds, Tele sounds, Strat sounds. This one I love because it, it gets uh, with the selector switch. I can EQ it or it's EQ with a selector switch that I can dial in your typical Gibson sounds, but then I have some different uh, options with this. So I just love it. It covers a lot of the bases in one setting. Okay. Um, thanks, Tom. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit more in depth with Tom about uh, his gear, uh, how he approaches uh, leading worship with a guitar. Uh, so we've talked to just about everybody in the band except uh, our auxiliary keyboard player. We saved the best for last. Uh, this is... Kiko from Puerto Rico. Uh, he actually lives in Nashville now. But um, Kiko is the auxiliary keyboard player. He's, you know, I'm playing keys all the time, almost on every song. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kiko's uh, in kind of a support mode, mm -hmm. uh, supporting what I do. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, he, he provides a lot of atmosphere for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, just the overall pad. We call him the pad man because mm -hmm. that's what he's doing a lot of times. So, uh, Kiko, talk about uh, kind of your approach to, um, uh, obviously, if you're leading yourself, you can play differently, but as, a, right. as an auxiliary keyboard player, what's mm -hmm. your approach? Um, I guess as an auxiliary player, I'm always, I'm kind of locked into what the piano player is doing. Uh, we kind of have to, we kind of have to live, uh, I, it's my job to support Don on what he's doing. Um, so I don't want to take up a whole lot of space, uh, but um, but I want to make sure I'm supporting him and that he feels like, you know, even if he has to let up for a second, you know, that there'll be coverage there. But a lot of times it's playing in different spaces. So if he's playing in a, in a particular uh, inversion, then I should invert up and play something different. Uh, so a lot of times, even sonically, uh, he's playing piano and driving it for the most part. Uh, so usually I kind of have an EP that's sort of always on, and it's very warm. I mean, you wouldn't play it to lead by yourself. You know, it kind of sounds like this. You know, and by itself, it's nothing special, but then it allows my pads to kind of blend in with it. And give me so, a little uh, attack. Uh, let's take, take thank you, Lord, for instance. What what are you playing like on, on the verse? Well, what, what are you playing on the intro? Yeah, I'm just highlighting you. So. Okay. And what are you doing on the verse? I'm just locking I in. I come before you today. There's just one thing that I want to say. That's really it. <laughs> pretty, pretty simple. You, Lord, let's go to the pre-chorus. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. That's it. And thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. That's, that's pretty much I it. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you. Okay. You know, so, so my Yeah, so it's super sparse, just mm -hmm. uh, way kind of in the background. That's auxiliary yeah. keys. I mean, he is not the lead keyboard player, and I'm, I'm playing, you know. I come before you today. So I'm doing that. If he was doing that as well, it's just going to take up a lot of space in the mix. And so he's like way back, just mm -hmm. kind of doing this pad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you almost don't know he's there, but if he pulls out, uh, you definitely notice a difference. So he's creating yeah. an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, what kind of uh, keyboard are you playing and, and yeah. what kind of sounds are you using? Um, well, I'm using... Uh, a Nord Stage 2 that can kind of cover all the bases. Uh, I really like it because a lot of times, it, you know, I have to play B3 as well. Um, so it allows me to kind of have a very useful B3 and piano and in a pinch where I can't have another keyboard to, to play pads. 
Um, I can dial in some pads as well and kind of layer them all. So I have a total of five layers that I can do, um, which is really nice. And you can route it different ways. I can connect a computer to it and control it as well. Um, so, and that's the thing as an auxiliary person, it's literally that, an auxiliary. So you have to, you, the fun part is there's a lot of different layers and fun things that I can create, you know, like in the, in the verse, um, you know, uh, like play the verse for a second. I come before so here, you today. I'm playing pad. There's just one thing that I But I can start easing in some strings. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And it doesn't seem like it makes a difference, but then when you go into the once you start going into the pre-chorus, you know, um, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Before he goes into a grateful heart, I can swell the strings in with a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched Then I can bring in some B3. I will bless your name and thank you. I you know? just want to. So the reason that's the reason why we I'm not playing a lot of notes is because I have to be able to bring in some other instruments there and still leave space for everybody else so you can feel the string section you can feel kind of a pad you can feel some b3 in there but it's not overbearing if i just play chords with them and try to do the same thing it's going to be a mess as you'll hear in a All second right, talk about uh the simplicity of uh, your approach i mean you mm -hmm. do a thing where you um what do you yeah i do this thing where i kind of just tend to put a pen in my hand um or or a stick you know, so so I kind of just go for that. Um, so and it helps me it helps me kind of just stay in a certain place, you know, so that I can't play too many notes. You see, you know, so what that does is it keeps me from having to play five or six or seven notes. And that all started by mistake. I was, you know, writing out some charts and stuff and I had a pen in my hand and I was starting to play. And I was like, oh, I like those extensions are really nice, you know, and and um so that that's how I stumbled across that, but it's a very useful tool because you want space. So you you tell keyboard. You, you, actually, I've seen you do it with a pen in both hands. Yep. Uh, put a pen in both of your hands, mm -hmm. and it it limits you. You actually only have three <laughs> fingers you can play with, or two. Yeah, three or four at the most. It's dep it depends how you do it. But um, the reality is, as an auxiliary player, the 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 less real estate you can take up, the better. Um, because, I mean, there's always moments where, you know, things happen and you're playing pads and you can be a little fuller in transitions and things. But in the actual song, I mean, you're if you're playing over four notes, it's 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 going to start taking up space. A, a, a lot of the ways I use Kiko, um, I mean, he creates an atmosphere. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do as worship leaders is we're trying to create an atmosphere that allows us to have a conversation with God. I mean, a dialogue with God. I mean, and, and part of that is setting the right tone and the right atmosphere. And it's not about manipulation. It's just about trying to set the right tone. And uh, you'll hear Kiko, like for instance, on the end of um, uh, that song, you know, uh, let's just say we ended in the key of F. Thank you, Lord. And if I wanted to go into a moment, Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. Thank you for your love, for being with us here today. We give you thanks, and we give you praise. So you hear what Kiko's doing. He, he's just kind of there, setting this atmosphere of worship. And, um, and he's, he's listening to what I'm saying. Talk about you, you pray as you play. It's just that approach. Yeah, um... It's it's a it's a beautiful thing and in a lot of genres of music, you know, you just play the music and in worship and in church we get we get this wonderful opportunity to kind of lift up lift up the name of, of Jesus and, and, and to even pray things into the atmosphere, even through our instruments. And I think that's so awesome and sometimes um I could even take that for granted that I had you know, that we're given that opportunity and um, a lot of times when a pastor is preaching and, and, or a worship leader is speaking, sometimes keyboard players take that, that time to kind of go crazy. And, um, and it's not meant for that. You know, a lot of times if you just sit back and you think from a person that's in the audience, you can see, you know, this person is praying. 
So anything anyone on stage is doing should be contributing to what that person is doing and what's being highlighted in that moment. So if Don's praying, then I, I, I want to pray along with him. And, he's, and if he's praying for peace, then I don't want to be rambunctious and play, you know, really busy things. I kind of want to be very, very subtle, you know, and and do that, you know. And if he starts praying for the power, you know, of God to fall on the place, then, yeah, then you can start, you know, kind of, you know, go there a little bit, you know, maybe add some strings. And it's not manipulation. It's you're actually getting a chance to participate in the prayer yeah of the person that's that's praying. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot about uh, more about that. We'll get some in-depth uh, time with Kiko and uh, the two of us together. Um, but while we're talking to Kiko, um, it, we're, we're talking about what he does uh, supporting my prayers. And uh, this can be uh, really helpful or can re be really aggravating if, if a keyboard player is not sensitive. For instance, uh, uh, like on the song, Thank You, Lord, I may start... Um, you know, the Bible says to enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So it would be very natural for me to just say, Lord, we thank you today um, in advance for all that you're going to do. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. It would be very natural for me to do that. But, um, you know, Kiko could take control of that prayer and, and make it all about himself. Like, uh, Lord, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your presence in this place. And now I'm distracted as I'm playing because my ears are going over there. And I was trying to give the Lord thanks. And, and all of you in the audience are also looking over at Kiko. And suddenly... Uh, he has made this tender little moment about him. And Kiko, <laughs> it's not about you. <laughs> so, well, you know, we, we, we make examples like that, but it's, it's sad, but it's true. People do that, and it's like, wow, I have a moment. I'm going to do everything I can do. And if the moment becomes about you, I mean, if your pastor is praying and suddenly you're just, your keyboard player is all over the place, uh, it suddenly became uh, about uh, about the, your keyboard player, and I think you've totally missed it at that point. Uh, by the way, just a little uh, note here about technology. I love technology. I love the screens. I love all the stuff, the lights. I love everything we can do, but technology can also uh, drive your service, and if you become a slave to your technology, then you've got it all uh, out of whack. Uh, the, the technology is there. I love production and technology, but it's there to support the overall moment. And what we're trying to do is introduce people uh, to God. We're trying to create a moment that allows them to touch the presence of a living God. And, and, and if you can support that with all the technology, I believe you can, but it's the same thing. It needs to happen as a team. If it becomes about the technology, then you've kind of gotten off track. So uh, uh, with, uh, let's just, we're going to break down a song here. Uh, thank you, Lord, since we've been working with that one. We'll break it down and, uh, and just, uh, you, you've heard how simply these guys are playing, playing as a team and, and, uh, uh, just this is the way we approach playing the song. Now, if we approach it differently, let them go crazy. It's going to have a completely different feel. But uh, just let's just start the song like we normally play it. Uh, kick it off, uh, Timmy. Could you be playing? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you've given to me. For all the blessings that I can. <laughs> kind of like that. You. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's it's funny. Uh, it, you know, you probably liked that. I kind of did. But uh, if it, he gets, if everybody gets that busy, the song's gonna be crazy. Uh, Tommy, what are you doing? I come before you today. Just one thing that I thank you. It's pretty simple. Is that all you got? You. given to me for all the blessings that I actually not bad you know uh, I feel 50 years younger um, it's great but again is the guys are trying to dialing into what works for Don Moen you know okay uh, you got to be authentic about who the who's your who the artist is and you know um, uh, that they, they play to the style of my music but uh, uh, Timmy uh, okay you know I know what you're playing simple I come before you Just one thing that I thank you, Lord. Now, if you were being asked, it's the first time you had a chance to play drums in a church, you young guy, you could overplay. That's a little over the edge. Um, but, you know, uh, we, we do this. It's kind of fun. It's kind of crazy. But it, it, is, it actually happens. And, and you know it happens. Maybe it's happened in your church. But you, know, you pull a guitar player up or a drummer up for the first time, and it's like, oh, my gosh, i got to play every lick I've ever learned in this one song. And, uh, and the, the, what you got to learn is, is discipline. you got to hold back. Uh, there'll be plenty of time to play those notes, but you got to play to the song. So less is more. All right, uh, Jason, uh, I know you're playing nothing on the verse, right? Uh, but remember now, you're um, a first-time bass player, got a first shot at playing in church, and you're trying to play every lick you ever know. So, I come before you today. There's just one thing that I Suddenly I had this feeling yeah. it's all about Jason. Um, yeah, um, you played more notes uh, in that first little section than in you usually play in the whole song. Uh, but these guys can all fill and add a lot of notes, but they're disciplined enough to play to the song. And like I said, less is more. And Lenny, with your simple little, uh, you say it's a nice light, nice light touch on the guitar. So... If you were going to, now I know you never would, but if you were going to overplay, 
what would it sound like? I come before you. <laughs> Just one thing that I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you join them? For all you've given to me. Everybody, overplay a little bit. I think I ought to do a, a new <laughs> album like that. Um, so, again, and not play it the right way, the chorus. Thank you, Lord. You, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Now the song kind of makes sense. It, it kind of makes sense because it's like, okay, that everybody's there supporting the one thing, but wow, I felt like a, um, a, a just a little tiny bystander in, in a band of soloists there for a moment. <laughs> and uh, maybe you feel that way sometime as well as a worship leader. So again, if you've got these uh, uh, young guys in your band, I'm saying young, but it could be any age, but somebody wants to overplay all the time, you need to be strong enough as a leader to just say, uh, all right, um, Mr. Guitar Player, time out. You have to take six weeks and sit on the on the front row of the church while until you learn that this is not about you it's about god that's what this is about that's why we do this so if anybody in your band kind of tries to uh, hijack the service or the song and make it about them uh, as a leader you and your pastor need to kind of pull the young lad or lassie over and just kind of say um it, it's i think we just need to have you sit out for a while it's not about you. You need to do this in love as well because young guys come in, they just want to play. There's a loving way to do that. Just put your arm around them and just uh, mentor them a bit. Just tell them, uh, show them an example of what to do and what not to do. So um, anyway, um, we'll, do, uh, we'll close with um, one more song and just uh, we'll, we'll call it a day, but it's been great being with you. I hope this has been helpful. We've had a lot of fun. It's been... Uh, it's been kind of crazy, but uh, uh, and saying what what we could do and what we should do. Uh, so I hope it's been helpful. This is my prayer. 
song that I sing, every prayer that I pray, every offering I bring, with every thought that I have, every word that I say, be glorified. Oh yes, be glorified. Oh yeah, be glorified. is our prayer today, Lord, that everything we do, everything we offer up to you would bring you glory, bring you honor, and bring you praise. I ask you to uh, touch my brothers and sisters. I ask you to stir up the gift that's in them, Lord, the gift of leading worship, the gift of songwriting, uh, the gift of new melodies and new chords. Stir them up, Lord, I pray. Be glorified in everything we do and in everything we say. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, we're going to do a lot more in-depth with uh, Tom and Kiko, uh, Tim and Jason. Uh, we'll even do a vocal session as well. So there's a lot more uh, if, you, if you have the time for the resources. I just feel this is, a, is something I love to do. It's, an, it's a necessity for worship teams, worship leaders, and pastors alike. I want us to become excellent uh, at what God has called us to do. And we can, we can all make a decision that this time next year, we're going to be at a different level in responding to God in worship. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>